being so obedient. We're so lucky to have three candidates who are giving up a perfectly wonderful Vermont summer uh, to do this for us. And we're, uh, we're privileged to have them in Stratford this afternoon to keep us from pickling our cucumbers or mountain biking or all the other amazing things that we could be doing. Uh, take a look, is it Tom? Uh, your tips for uh, using the microphone. Uh, it is necessary to use the mic. Uh, no need to shout. Have the thing about six to six inches away from your mug. And uh, we'll be broadcasting in Siberia and the Ukraine. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Mark McDonald, our uh, good Orange County Senator. Do we have any other candidates we should acknowledge here? Besides Jim Masland, I noticed. Who else? <laughs> Becca White. Who else? Thank you, Becca. D. Gish. All right. D. From what town? What towns are you running in? Thank you. Now we'll get to Patricia. Yes. Anybody else? Oh, Jim Masland. Thank you. Jim, what towns? Same ones. Okay. Good. Any other candidates? Anyway, we're so uh, glad that you uh, three congressional candidates are here to join us today. We're, I mean, it's really amazing what you do. No other rational person uh, stands in the grocery store line at the checkout to get abuse from their neighbors. And, so on. So we're going to want to know um, why you're doing it. And why don't we start with you, uh, Lewis Myers. Um, oh, I should say, I got my Wordle in three this morning. How many of you do Wordle? <laughs> anyway, don't wreck my good mood by being long-winded today. We've got a lot of questions to cover. And I'm going to emphasize questions that have to do with judgment and character and values, and not so many that have to do with wonkier issues. We've got a ton of them, uh, from healthcare to agriculture to foreign affairs and so on. So I'm hoping that some of you in the audience will provide those more specific wonkier questions if you've got a, or I shouldn't say wonky, they're important questions, but they're ones that are more technical than the, the more general ones that I hope that you uh, three candidates will give us a glimpse of who you are, what your character is, how you make decisions, and uh, don't be afraid to use humor. Um, uh, color outside the lines, if that's okay. I mean, if that's good. And, all right, let's get on with it. So brevity will be rewarded. And uh, we're going to see if this experiment works. So the previous, the person who gets the prize for really tightening up their answers is urban. Is that what I was going to say? It's fancy great. Uh, this is the sound of this came out of our The sap for this came off of Allison's in my land this year, and uh, we're happy to be back sugaring for the first time in 30 years, and it's the person who boiled it uh, is a guy named Cody Armstrong in Rand uh, Randolph Center, Vermont. He calls himself CDA Maple, and it's wonderful stuff, and this is called Robust, which means not fancy grade A, but uh, so, first question. Yeah, sorry, yes. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And Billy is our relentless uh, velvet bulldozer timekeeper. Um, if you go through Billy's stop sign, you're in big trouble. So, Billy, gosh. Are there any other people from the Orange County Dems uh, organization we should acknowledge? Or should we? Sherry Merrick. Where's Sherry? 
sharing that. Thank you. We got the magnificent uh, David Curtis Bill Hoff Award this year. Yeah. So. so you want to mention what the validity is for the answers? Say that again. What the validity is for the answers? Oh, yes. So we'll tell you uh, before each uh, question whether it's 30 seconds or a minute. But they'll be mostly pretty short. And there'll be a few that are yes or no. Um, they'll be obvious. So. And there'll be, a, there'll be a warning? Is that the warning? And then there'll be a So tell us why uh, you're the candidate this year who has to get elected to Congress. What's the, what's the reason you're running and this year, starting with Lewis? Hi, I'm Dr. Lewis Myers. I uh, work up at Rutland. We, uh, I'm sorry, there, one minute. I'm Dr. Lewis Myers, and I work up at Rutland Regional Medical Center as one of the physicians. We also want to say one of our Colleagues, uh, Sinead Chase Clifford is uh, ill today, but uh, usually she's here with us and we will hope to see her later this week at our next get together. Um, I decided to run for several reasons. One is I just felt there would needed to be a diversity of voices and a diversity of experience. Um, we represent, including Ms. Chase Clifford, four different decades uh, in which we were born. So each of us was born in a different decade. Being older does not necessarily always mean better. Is that? Oh, goodness. Uh, but uh, if you keep your heart and mind open, uh, it brings a certain perspective. And I feel that I have done that over the years and uh, would like to bring some of that perspective and understanding of human nature that I've gotten through many years as a physician uh, to this campaign. Thanks. Okay. So the reason why I decided after eight years in the state senate of serving the state uh, to run for Congress is very personal. Uh, my great, my grandfather was killed in the Holocaust. He was um, killed in the last few weeks of the war on a far forced march from concentration camp in Austria. And I was raised with the sense that democracies do not fail overnight. They fail little by little as rights are being stripped away, as people are scapegoated. That is the moment that we're in right now. Our democracy is in peril. And the scourge of authoritarianism and the rise of the autocrats is not particular to our country, but this is where our fight is. And that is what drives me to run at this time. Thank you. Thanks. Molly. Good afternoon, Orange County Democrats and attendees. It's wonderful to be home. And I do feel sitting here that we are the heart of democracy. Uh, I'm running for Congress because I know the challenges we face today will not be solved by Vermont alone. From a prolific workforce crisis, to our deep housing needs, um, to our child care needs, to paid family and medical leave and broadband access, we need strong federal leaders ready to deliver for Vermont. I spent nearly a half decade working in Congress. I know that the State House is in Congress and Montpelier is in Washington and I've worked in both. I'm also a lawyer, I've served as an assistant attorney general at a time when we desperately leader, need leaders ready to codify Roe and to protect fundamental rights. And I've worked overseas, both with the International Committee of the Red Cross and working to promote human rights. And at this time, I know we need leaders ready to step up to the plate and make strong forward policy decisions. And I've served statewide and continue to as your 82nd Lieutenant Governor and will show up in Washington every single day for every corner of our state, but particularly for Orange County. Wonderful, sticking to the time, that's great, thank you. Becca, what's your proudest moment of being an American? Uh, sorry, I'm being an what, American. What's, what is your proudest moment for being an American? And this is the same question for all three of you. That's you've got a minute. I appreciate it, that's a tough one. Um, I have a lot of proud moments. Um, I love this country. I'm a child of an immigrant. I was born on a US Army base in Germany. And I often feel like uh, immigrants and children of immigrants love this country in some ways uh, like no other people can because they know what the alternative is. Um, when I got married, when um, we passed civil union, I was married at the, uh, the Grange in Dummerston. It was an incredible uh, highlight of my life. But then when we finally passed civil marriage, 
and I got married on the town green in Norwich and was married by the Supreme Court Justice that my wife had clerked for, and my son was in the car watching us. That was a proud, proud day for me as an American. Thanks, Don. Wonderful. Wherever I've been in the world, people have said, where are you from? And I always say, I'm from Vermont. And they say, is that Canada? I say, no, that's in the United States. I was deeply proud to be from Vermont, but I think it's pretty rare that you can grow up on a farm in Orange County. I grew up at Four Corners Farm on the other side of the county in Newberry. Um, to go through our school system right here in the state from Newberry Elementary School uh, through Vermont Law School, just over the mountain, and to be able to be here on the stage today running for Congress uh, in a state that is the only one that hasn't sent a woman to Washington. So it makes me proud to be a citizen of this country, but deeply proud to be a Vermonter. Great. Lewis? Well, I was a college wrestler, and <clears throat> following this junior year in college, I was able to be a member of the United States wrestling team that went to Iran. Now the Shah was still in power for another year or two. Uh, it, that wrestling is Iran's culture, it is their national sport. And walking onto the map against their world champion uh, in front of about 15,000 screaming Iranian men, but wearing a United States uniform, carrying the United States flag, uh, that was a moment. Pretty cool. Uh, these questions coming from the audience are magnificent, by the way. Uh, since the largest, thank you, Gene. Um, the largest contributor to, cl to the climate disaster is the U.S. military. I don't know where that came from, but uh, we'll assume for the moment that it's true. Uh, would you have voted the $40 billion weapons to Ukraine uh, vote? Would you have voted yes on that? And will you vote for the next Pentagon budget? There is a similar question Maybe you could fold into that one minute answer. Would you support cutting the defense budget by at least 10%? Please, a yes or no answer on that second one. Why don't we start with you, Dr. Myers? Uh, yes, I would have supported, I do support the, the aid we're giving to, to Ukraine. I think uh, that is an immediate threat to not only their democracy, but de democracies across Europe. In terms of the cost cutting, I am leery of putting an actual number on the cost cutting. I would suggest, or I would point out that some years ago, when uh, there was a base closing commission that was established by the federal government so that an independent commission could make recommendations on which military bases were no longer really useful and could be reasonably closed. Um, that took it out of the uh, partisan bickering among individual Congress people. Uh, and it actually turned out to be quite successful. So I think we need to use more of that. Thank you. Becca? So I think like many Vermonters, we're very wary about what's happening in Ukraine now. And we don't want to be involved in an endless war again. I do support uh, the support that we've given to, given to Ukraine, as I said earlier. Uh, this is part of a movement of authoritarianism across the globe. And I think it's very important that we stand with Ukraine. Um, I just want to bring up an issue here that um, I think is implied in the question, Don, which is, you know, we've been dealing with the rise of the military industrial complex since Eisenhower first identified it. And one of the things he was most concerned about was the rise of the use of military contractors. And this, this I think, is one of the most dangerous trends that we've seen uh, in terms of the way that our money is spent in the military. So certainly would be open to uh, cutting the military budget, but wanting to make sure that we're ready to meet this moment uh, with Ukraine and other countries that may be suffering at this time. Oh, great, thanks. I think the first question was regarding climate change and the military. And we know that the Joint Chiefs for the last decade plus has been signaling to not only this country, but to the world that this is a national security, this is an international security issue. So we need to act extremely quickly and listen to the military on that, in addition to listening to all of us each day as we're experiencing climate change in our daily lives. Um, as an international human rights lawyer, as someone who worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross, both in Washington uh, with the HASC and SACS, head of House and Senate Armed Service Committees, um, in places of conflict around the, around the globe, I know the decisions that Congress has to make. I know how extremely important it is that we have a military budget that aligns with 
uh, our greatest security challenges. And I believe that our budget doesn't meet those challenges now, that it is um, too much, it's too big, and it needs to be modernized. So while I won't answer the question of the number because I want to go through a process of reviewing it, my focus from my work is we have to invest in diplomacy. We have a State Department that's largely been stripped of support. We've tried to regain that through the Biden administration. But without investing in diplomacy, without investing in strong foreign policy, without investing in humanitarian aid, we're not going to prevent, prevent the next conflict. Thank you, Mom. Uh, another one from the floor. <clears throat> Given the recent stymie from Joe, <clears throat> from Joe Man Manchin to move meaningful climate leg legislation in the U.S. Senate, how do you plan to move forward meaningful climate legislation in the House? How can we make the changes necessary to actually make progress on this? Molly, why don't we start with you? Sure. I think we need to take stock of what we've been able to do right here in Vermont through weatherization programs, installing heat pumps across the state, getting more and more Vermonters into electric vehicles, and recognize that with strong federal support, we can supercharge, if you will, what we already have going. At the federal level, uh, for me personally, the Committee on Energy and Commerce, where Congressman Welch has served, I worked for him when I worked in Washington, uh, has, so, has served so well. I want to be on that committee because I want to make sure that we have the funding and the support that we need uh, to do that. Subsidies. Right now, fossil fuel sub companies are making a racket. Thank you. And the situation hasn't changed for them. Um, so doing everything we can to take that money, invest it in renewables, uh, making sure that we reauthor reauthorize the tax credit for renewables here in the state. And certainly as someone who's worked in the uh, international state, showing up regularly um, with the Paris Agreement, making sure that we're walking the walk and talking the talk here at home. Great. Becca? So certainly uh, support a lot of the things that the Lieutenant Governor just said, I know, uh, we're very much in alignment on issues around this um, issue from um, ending fossil fuel subsidies to uh, putting a tax on windfall profits on fossil fuels, the other thing that um, is affecting all of us right now. Um, certainly want to invest in a rural Green New Deal because it is an opportunity for us. Um, it is a, a frightening moment for all of us. I have two kids. We talk about climate change a lot in my household. But one thing I want to say is a lot of Vermonters are feeling stymied by how we talk about this issue and they're feeling paralyzed. And one of the things that I've been talking about a lot with my neighbors in rural areas in my district is what are the opportunities that we have when we actually transition off of fossil fuels? And so the way that liberals and conservatives talk about the environment and their place in it is very different and we have to get much better at messaging, not just within our caucus, but with people outside. Thank you. Thanks. Well, first of all, let me just say, I, I don't think of Joe Manchin as the devil. Uh, he represents a coal state uh, where, and, and so it's understandable to some extent that he is representing people in his district and his state. Um, having said that, I think he's open, and I think some of the other senators are open to alternatives. We have to make it worth their state's while. We have to make it clear that we're going to replace many of those jobs that they are, have lost and are losing with, with other alternatives in the, in the environmental sector. And I think we can do that. Um, I have been a, a supporter of a full range uh, of uh, options, uh, wind, solar, um, water, and, uh, and nuclear power. And um, we get 30% of our energy in this country now from nuclear power, and I think that we're going to have to continue that. I think we could actually expand it. Um, there are other uh, things such as fusion power and hydrogen power, which uh, scientists are making great progress on as well. So I am hopeful, but I think we have to be realistic and work with what we have in Congress right now. Thanks. This is a 15 second one. And the only reason it needs to be 15 seconds is you may have to think hard. <clears throat> if you could solve any problem, what would you choose to solve? Uh, paid family and medical leave. As an aging state, I think it's one of the uh, most important ways to keep working folks in the workforce, but also able to have kids and care for loved ones. Great. Yeah. 
the unconscionable wealth gap that we have right now. So many of the issues that we're dealing with in the state go back to the fact that wages have been flat since 1970 and there is no middle class anymore. So that for me is uh, an issue that must be tackled in order to tackle the other issues. I think campaign financing, I mean, it, it, it's a huge, huge problem, and, but it, it determines who gets elected and who gets elected determines what, we're, what we do about all these other issues. This kind of turns on the, the point that Becca was making a moment ago. What do you think you can do personally to reduce the partisanship in the United States House? 30 seconds. I'm sorry, Dr. Hart. Uh, well, I, I have from the start stated that I'm a, a moderate Democrat, and I know sometimes in some places that's not popular, in other places it might be. Um, there is a problem solvers caucus in Congress. I think it includes 38 Congress people now, both uh, moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans. They are working on some uh, workable solutions, what we hope will be workable solutions for immigration, for climate, for energy, and, and a host of other things. I would certainly want to be part of them. I would also approach the other physicians. There are 13 physicians in the House now, both Republicans and Democrats, and I think I can work with them to make significant change. Cool. Becca? So I've been a coalition builder here in the legislature, both as majority leader and as a president pro tem, and would certainly use those skills and the skills that I've developed as a middle school teacher. Um, but I also want to say that I have been part of an interesting group by a writer named Amanda Ripley, who wrote a book called High Conflict. And I meet with her and other um, leaders from across the nation. Some of us are Democrats, some of us are Republicans, some of us are independents. We get in a Zoom every month for an hour and a half, and we talk about how we talk across difference and make meaningful change. What I've learned working for Congressman Welch and also Pat Leahy, that if you show up in Washington and start name calling, you're gonna lose friends pretty fast, and as one of 435, you need to make friends as quickly as possible. Uh, as lieutenant governor, I think it's no secret to anyone that I wasn't Phil Scott's chosen lieutenant governor, but it took quite a bit of time to build a rapport with him, and each day as folks come into my office, I don't say, what party are you in? I say, what's your challenge? How can I help? And I think it begins in Congress, as I know, spending a lot of time there, showing up and focusing on the issues asking folks, do you have rural broadband in uh, your most rural county? And starting from the issues, building the strongest coalitions, but putting the name calling and party politics aside. Great. Are people in the back able to hear all right? Good, thank you. Um, Vermont is tiny, but we've had an outsized influence. Going back in my lifetime to think about uh, Governor Aiken, who was then in the U.S. Senate, and he said, uh, why don't we just say we won in Vietnam and come home? Uh, <laughs> since then, we've had several presidential candidates who've done uh, amazingly uh, nationally, Howard Dean and Bernie twice. Um, Patrick Leahy is third in line for the presidency. So we've had, for a tiny state, an immense influence. What do you hope will be your brand in Congress, Molly? I think that the beauty of our leaders in Washington has been that they've been able to operate at the most local level. Um, Senator Aiken grew up in Putney on a farm, and then, as Don said, have been able to make very, very big foreign policy decisions. Uh, Senator Leahy on the forefront of protecting civil rights. Um, Peter Welch on the forefront of energy efficiency nationally. And I think that we need leaders who are able to operate at the most local level, be it you know, here in Orange County, thinking about the needs of our communities, but also when those really tough foreign policy decisions or really tough decisions come up around how are we going to codify all of the rights that are being stripped away by the Supreme Court right now, are able to put all of those skills to use. Thanks. Becca? So I taught in four different rural public schools, um, and I certainly use my experience as a teacher in understanding the lives of my students and the families that came into the school that really shaped the work that I did in the legislature, a lot of work around supporting families. And I think you asked, what would be my brand? Uh, it's a hard thing because we don't want to think of ourselves as a brand as much as a person. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, when Senator Robin Hinsdale dropped out of the race and endorsed me, for this seat. She said, what I learned from Becca is 
She knows that sometimes you have to be a fighter, sometimes you have to be a defender, and sometimes you have to be a peacemaker. And I have all of those tools in my toolbox and I've used them all in the Senate. Thanks. Well, I want to make an announcement right now that I am not running for president of the United States. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, given where I am in my life uh, right now, uh, I would not be in this as a career politician. Uh, what I would be there to do is be a workhorse. You know, in Congress, in the Senate, there are show horses and there are workhorses, as Al Franken uh, notably described. And I would want to be there as a workhorse. Pick one or two topics, and for me, obviously, healthcare would be one of them. Focus on it, work with the other people that are willing to work with you, and let's get some things done. That's, that's why I'm there. Thanks. What do you think, 30 seconds, is the most important foreign policy issue that you'll face? What needs to be addressed first? Becca? I think the rise of authoritarianism. I think that is the biggest challenge. Um, it is not something that is just happening, happening overseas. It's happening right here. Um, just looking at the paper this morning, seeing that Viktor Orban in my family's home country of Hungary uh, is now going after the LGBTQ community. And you can bet that those same forces here at home are looking to see what is Bolsonaro doing? What is Viktor Orban doing? What are they able to get away with? And that's the roadmap. And so I think that's gonna be a huge challenge for us. Thanks, Lewis? Well, I think there's two things. One is the rise of authoritarianism, but on the other hand, there's also a rise of tremendous social unrest, given the inflation and the fact that people are literally starving to death in, in a number of countries around the world now. Uh, there's climate uh, change, which is affecting people. So these are cataclysmic uh, developments in every region of the world. And uh, the United States, they still look to the United States, the rest of the world, to lead. And it's a heavy burden. We've carried it for many years. It's, we are not going to be able to put it down just yet. So leadership by the United States. Thanks. I think most immediately it's the day-to-day -day concern of Ukraine and what that means for democracies around the globe. But we can't stop there. Obviously, climate change, that it's going to impact all of us, um, global migration, national security, uh, democracy. What does that look like moving forward? The preservation of human rights when the U.S., when we are stripping away fundamental rights here, it impacts our ability to fight for them all across the globe. Uh, I'll certainly say that my generation, uh, I came of age after 9-11, and we have been at war under an AUMF that is outdated for the last uh, more than two decades. So the foreign policy issues are myriad, and Congress is going to have to deal with them. Thanks. Here's a yes or no question, <clears throat> Molly. Do you support a constitutional amendment that gives the Earth rights? I would have to do give you that support, a Do you support a constitutional amendment that gives the Earth, rivers, trees, and so on, rights? I have to give that much more thought. I'm open to learning and understanding, but at this moment, not without more consideration. A uh, similar answer. I mean, that's a really interesting idea, and I can see why it would be really useful at this moment. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm open to the idea, but I need to really ponder what that means. Thank you. No, I think we have enough, uh, enough legal uh, ramifications. Almost every decision is being made that we don't need to have lawyers representing the river. We don't need lawyers representing the river. Is that what you said? This okay. sounds like a this sounds like a law professor question. Just come from someone in the back. <laughs> Becca, how is lawmaking in Washington different from making sausage in Vermont? Just thirty seconds. That's what I was gonna. That's what I was say. How many seconds have I got? Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. So. You know, I think we probably all get asked this a lot. Like, it, it, another way of asking that is, why would any of us in our right mind want to go to Congress right now when it's so dysfunctional, when it's so toxic, when we have um, insurrectionists literally serving in Congress? And so is, is the State House like Congress? Absolutely not. However, it's all made up of flawed people in the same way that the State House here in Vermont is made up of flawed people. And yet we still have to do the work. We can't say it's broken, it's toxic. We don't roll our sleeves up and try to do the work. 
Molly? That's pretty clear. Uh, Congress has a completely different role than the Vermont legislature. It has a significant oversight role of government spending, government action. There's authorization bills and appropriation bills that largely track each other, be it the National Defense Authorization Act or the State Department Authorization Bill. Uh, there's also the Rules Committee in the House, which we don't have in Montpelier. It helps guide sort of, um, when bills come to the floor, how much time is the, the, the counter to the filibuster in the House. And so I think those are pretty significant distinctions. It's 24-7 as well, and you have to be ready to lead at any moment. Dr. Myers? Well, I think things have changed. I remember a time in, in an office when things were different. When I was much, much younger, I interned, volunteered intern in Washington for Senator Edward Kennedy. He had a tremendous staff. Of course, he was a brilliant senator and hardworking, but he had a tremendous staff who knew legislation and the legislative process inside and out. And I, I felt like I saw the legislative process at its very best, and perhaps someday we'll move back in that direction. That's great. We'll start with you, Dr. Myers. Give a genuine and sincere compliment to someone on the stage. <laughs> I, I could say to both of them and to Shanae if she was here, I, and I've said this before in other debates, uh, this is our eighth or ninth time together, and I, I told them I've seen more of them than my family, I think. But uh, no, I, I've been so impressed by the intelligence and the, uh, the passion of, of uh, the people that are in this campaign. I, as I've said before, I don't think Vermont will lose if any of the four Democrats who are in this race, if you choose any of them. Thanks, Becca. A uh, similar compliment to the one I gave the Lieutenant Governor when we wrapped up our session. The two of us worked really well together, leaving politics uh, outside the chamber in the Senate, and we did our work, and it did not come into play on the floor. And I just have to slip one in for Dr. Myers. A few weeks ago, I had a medical question, and he was willing to <laughs> look it up for me. <laughs> Say that we've been able to sit together and have civil discourse, and I've learned a lot from both Senator Ballin and Dr. Myers and Shanae, and um, I'm just deeply proud that this is how we conduct democracy in Vermont. Great answers. Now I'm going to really... <laughs> really screw this up by asking you to <laughs> present a serious and challenging question to someone on the stage. Molly? Yeah, I, I do want to take a moment and, and bring this up with a lot of civility, but also a little bit of concern. Um, I think I'll just start with a show of hands. How many folks here in this room have had access to paid family and medical leave through the state of Vermont? So I'm running for Congress in part because it's deeply personal to me. Um, caring for a loved one without you leaving the state is extremely hard. It's not theoretical. And on Friday, a ad went up on television from an outside group suggesting, quote, that Becca, quote, gave Vermont paid family and medical leave. And I think it's important that we recognize that that is not accurate and that is misleading. And I guess I'd like Becca to acknowledge that publicly. Well, I haven't seen the ad, but if that is in fact true, then it is misleading. We passed it several times in the Senate. Uh, it never went into law. But I just want to be clear, the super PAC spending is not something that I control. It's not something I invited. It's not something that I have any control over. I can't communicate with anyone spending this money. And it is something that I have denounced repeatedly. I denounce it again. Vermonters should get to decide how our officials are elected. But the ad is, and is inaccurate, and it is misleading if it suggests that. And again, I cannot communicate. It's illegal for me to communicate with a super PAC that is putting up the ad. I will continue to denounce it publicly. That's not who I am. That's not what I want. And I will say it over and over again. If it was misleading, would you ask it to be taken down? Again, of course I would ask to have it taken down. We are not allowed to communicate with super PACs. It's against the law. Both of you okay on that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Dr. Myers. Um, well, we, uh, Ms. Ballant uh, brought up a few minutes ago the role of military contractors, and, and I know Ms. Gray, Lieutenant Governor Gray, has worked overseas with uh, overseeing or helping some of the military contractors in terms of their human rights, following human rights. What do you see as the role going forward 
uh, military contractors overseas versus using our regular military? Yeah, sure. In uh, war zones. In yeah, so first, um, military contractors are illegal. I uh, just want to be really clear about that. But there are private security contractors that work here in Vermont, that work across the state or work internationally. Uh, when I was working for Congressman Welch, she led the first investigations of Blackwater into Miso Square. And 10 years later, I helped launch an international human rights or organization to hold private security contractors accountable to human rights um, abuses, or human rights abuses, and accountable to some sort of international standard, and led the first mission into um, Iraq, and led missions into East Africa, into Nigeria, investigating companies, and trying to hold them accountable to some sort of standard. So, do they exist? Yes. Do I think they're right? No. Do they need to be highly regulated? Yes. Does Congress have a huge role to play? Absolutely. I'm a moderate Republican turned off by Democrats. I think Senator Ballin would like to. I'm so busy trying to think of the Of next course. Thing. You're in the hot seat over there, Donnie. You got the lights on you. <laughs> Pretty hot. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Myers. Sure. So I know that you have been a doctor for a long time, and um, we all can say that our healthcare system is not a system, it's broken. And I'm wondering, what are some decisions that you might have made along the way in your medical practice that you look back on now and thought I contributed to where we are now? That's a good question. Well, I had a private practice, my own practice for 14 or 15 years. And I was proud of it because I, in the sense that I took everyone from the community, this was actually down in Northern Virginia, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, uninsured. Um, I was chairman of the Department of Medicine for two years at my hospital. We worked to save the hospital. The, the big corporate entity tried to close it. That's a good question. I, I work as a hospitalist now, and I will tell you that it's a, a, hospitals of course only work in the hospital and then you have primary care out in the community. Um, I would like to see us get back to having the primary care people come back to the hospital. And I feel that as a hospital, so I'm contributing to that diversion, but right now at this point in my life, it was a, a terrific opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. I'm a moderate Republican turned off by Democrats' ardent wokefulness. How will you appeal to me, Molly? Yeah, um, I mean, I can say in this race, I've been called a corporatist Democrat. I've been called a catastrophe for the left, not for Vermont, but for the left. I think that it's incumbent upon us as Democrats to not fan the flames. It starts with not name calling, not trying to divide our own party, um, and really focusing on the issues. Let's bring it back to what it is that matters to our communities, matters to our state, matters to our country, and bringing people back together to get tough things done. And I'll work with anyone to do what's right for Vermont. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a strong track record of working with anyone who works with me in good faith. Uh, that's how you get work done in the legislature. The other thing I want to say is I feel like we are at this critical moment right now when, as I travel around the state, people say, I used to feel like I could talk to my neighbors about things and now I'm, I'm scared because our signs are different or um, we used to be able to find uh, a quiet space that was apart from politics and I feel like politics has slipped into everything. And so what I want, I'm out of time, aren't I? Okay, I will just say, this is something I think about all the time and I work very hard in my own life to do that. Dr. Myers. Yeah, I would try and stay out of the culture wars, as I've said before. I grew up in an era when there were moderate Republicans, Jacob Javits, Charles Chuck Percy, people like that. Um, even if they're not moderate Republicans, I would want to work with Republicans in character. I have the greatest respect, obviously, right now for Adam Kinzinger and Ms. Cheney. And even though our other political views would differ probably 95% of the time, uh, I would want to be their friend, possibly, and certainly their uh, work on them on some of the issues that might be important to all of us. Here's an attitude question, Beth. <clears throat> what makes you deliriously happy? And alternatively, what makes you angry, disappointed, or upset? 30 seconds. Uh, dogs generally make me deliriously happy. Uh, pretty much any dog of any type who's given me some love, I'm gonna love them right back. Um, 
What makes me so angry is the wealth disparity in this nation and our inability to see that the structures themselves have led to that. And we just need to have the will to change the structure and specifically around the racial wealth gap and how the structures that were put in place hundreds of years ago um, have led us to where we are now. We have work to do to fix the foundation. Thanks, Molly. What makes me deliriously happy? Uh, a good swim, um, hang out with my husband and our two stepkids. Uh, we did, went to the parade yesterday. I'm not sure it made them deliriously happy, but it made me pretty happy. Um, what drives me, what's the word, angry? Uh, to a point of deep concern, it gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, injustice, absolutely. Uh, a lack of fairness. Um, the ineffectiveness of Congress right now and the fact that they are supposed to, members of Congress are supposed to represent us but can't seem to get anything done for us. And so trying to show up every day with integrity, with truth, with civility, um, and trying to bring us forward to a new place where we can get out of where we are right now. Thanks. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm almost always happy at work because I enjoy the work I do. I enjoy helping the patients. I enjoy my colleagues. And I really like Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, what makes me unhappy is wanton cruelty. I think that I can excuse stupidity and 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 other such things, but just out and out cruelty. Thanks. Authenticity is on our minds. Thirty seconds, please. <clears throat> Give us an example of your authenticity, Molly. I think it's pretty bold to run for lieutenant governor as a first time candidate, but I felt pretty strongly that I had something to say. And now as a woman running for Congress in a state that hasn't um, elected a woman before, showing up every day, and I'm asking you to hire me, so I'm giving you every bit of myself, um, all of it. <laughs> so I think that's pretty authentic. Cool. Devin? Who I am in the state house, who I am in the classroom, who I am in my family at home is, is the same person. And so there isn't uh, a candidate Becca, there isn't teacher Becca, it's just Becca. And it's really exciting for me to have my students come back to me years later and say, you're still the same person that you were in the classroom. Um, I mean, I try and be authentic at work, it's particularly using uh, some humor at times, uh, empathizing with the sadness and difficult uh, conditions that people might be facing. But uh, humor goes a long way. That's a part of the I think. These are wonderful questions coming in, thank you. Assuming you're elected, what support would you like from us citizens once you're governor? Becca? Didn't I say governing? That's what I mean. Governing, governing. Okay. I'm sorry, there's a lot going on. Can you just say okay. that one more time, Don? Make Assuming sure you're elected, what support would you like from us citizens once you're governing? So we function best in any kind of, of governing, whether it's select board, school board, um, in the legislature, when we have open communication with our constituents. And one of the things that we learned this year and through the pandemic is you have to have multiple ways of communication with your constituents. So yes, town halls like this, very important. But you also have to have opportunities for people to zoom in, to call in, to have smaller uh, means of communication for people who don't feel comfortable being in a big group. And I'm out of time. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm going to try to get it right every single time, but there will be times when I won't get it right. And what's most important to me is showing up and asking you, you know, how can we do this better? Um, if you are an expert in something, can you, can you help me understand that? Be it solar or broadband or farming or social security system or you name it. And I think that's the role of good government, right? Let's understand the systems and how to reform them. Um, so. The worst feedback is no feedback, and I'll keep showing up, but I hope that I can count on you to um, help me get it right and to help me make things better along the way. Dr. Myers? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a op wonderful opportunity to be in a state like Vermont. I couldn't have run for Congress in, in larger states. I think this is a great opportunity. Um, I would hope that Vermonters, if I'm elected, would not take it personally. Uh, let's talk about the issues. Um, uh, one, one fellow chased me off his lawn with his gun. I thought he felt he was taking it a bit personally, and I hadn't even said anything yet other than I was a Democrat. So, uh, um, no, I, I, I think that, you know, we, I want to hear from everyone, because everyone's views are important, but let's, let's try and keep it uh, on a certain level. What was your first ever job, and what did you learn from it? Is that for me? Yeah. Oh, okay. My first ever job, I had a, a lawn mowing business with my brother when I was in junior high and he was in high school. And um, we took care of lawns all over our neighborhood. And um, it was really a wonderful experience as a young person working with my hands in that way, but also having something that I did with my brother yeah. that brought us really close together. I grew up on a farm, so I'm not sure I can remember the first jobs, pretty much all hands on deck all the time, but my dad's here today in the back, which means a lot to me. I know it's a busy time at the farm. Um, but I, I think my very first job, when I was tall enough to reach the register, I started working in the farm stand. And yeah, I learned how to make change bag tomatoes. You don't put them on the bottom, you put them on the top. And uh, I think there's a lot of good life skills that come from the day-to-day -day of the farm. Great. Uh, my first real job, you know, was, was as, actually as a probation officer in Washington, D.C. during the mid-80s. And I think it was a terrific opportunity. Uh, I was in a, working in a world that I had not necessarily lived in, uh, but got to see the, how people were struggling uh, to make reasonable and lives in very difficult situations. Will you put your assets in a blind trust and work to make that the case for all Congress people? <clears throat> Molly. I don't have any assets. <laughs> but um, uh, yes, I would certainly consider that. And I have been very vocal and feel very strongly that members of Congress, their spouses, shouldn't be trading stocks. I don't have any to trade. Um, uh, my husband doesn't anymore either. And we feel really strongly about that, not only during the campaign, but also certainly in Congress. Absolutely. Yes, and the answer is yes. And I, actually, I think the, even the Republicans have been shamed into saying yes on this one. We'll see, Dr. Myers. Dr. Myers, what two endorsements, name two endorsements that you're particularly proud of? Well, I haven't sought out endorsements. I don't have any of the major endorsements. I think the people that I work with in the hospital at Rutland, I think the patients, if you ask them, uh, would. Uh, a campaign among patients, obviously, and now we have masks, but um, I think people would, looking at the work I've done and the way I've gone about my work, that they would endorse me. Okay. So I was uh, very proud to receive Bernie Sanders' endorsement. I've been working on behalf of working people for my entire time in the Senate, and before that, um, working at the local level. I'm very proud of that. I'm also incredibly proud to have the endorsement of Representative Jamie Raskin, who is on the January 6th Commission, and I've gotten to know him over the last few months. And uh, to have a hero like him endorse me, um, I just, just no words. Thank you. Molly? I think the endorsements of hundreds of Vermonters who are working in our communities from all backgrounds, uh, to me, means the very most, but of course, uh, Governor Cunin, Madeline Cunin, was a mentor of mine, is a mentor of mine, um, helped me see beyond school and what was possible to see beyond the farm, and I wouldn't be here today without her support. So that's a big one. Thanks. Uh, bearing in mind that a lot of people in this audience have not seen this week's seven-page uh, seven cover story on this race, uh, did you consider it fair, the coverage, and if not, or is there any change, are there any, any mistakes you'd like to correct or any change of emphasis that you'd like to, because I'm sure that people will end up reading it. Okay. Uh, one minute. Thank you. Becca? I haven't read it yet. Oh, you haven't? Oh. I try not to read my press when I'm feeling 
agitated. <laughs> I will read it at some point, but I have not read it yet. How interesting. Dr. Myers. Well, I, I guess I should talk about this. Uh, uh, yes, I was pretty unhappy about seven days, and it brings up a bigger issue. Uh, there were a number of errors in the of commission and omission. They neglected to mention that I had been working for 10 years as a physician in Vermont, and then at the end they said I wasn't actively campaigning, which was in the furthest thing from the truth. Um, we only have a couple of major, two or three major uh, newspapers or news outlets in Vermont, and they have a huge influence, and I am concerned, uh, whether it's BT Digger, Seven Days, that, uh, that particularly when you're talking about a congressional race, which is hugely important, that they send out their most experienced reporters and most experienced editors, and that they treat each of the candidates fairly. Uh, I could have understood if there were 15 candidates in the race and they truly had to triage, but with only four in the race, I think seven days could have done a much better job, and I've shared that with their editor in no uncertain terms. Thank you. Molly? I'm so used to having stories not get it right all the time, so I, we just, it, I think that the story was, um, was what it was, but if I may add a little color commentary to um, my work as an assistant attorney general, I, one of the first cases that I was assigned in the bulk of my work was helping to lead an investigation into the St. Joseph's Orphanage in Burlington, which is an orphanage here in Vermont that was open for 125 years. 6,000 Vermont uh, children went through the orphanage and there were allegations of homicide, of physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, and spent months and months working with the Burlington Police Department, the Vermont State Police, the mayor's office, with victims advocates across the state, combing through documents, trying to bring to light what occurred, um, doing everything we could to bring forward what happened and helping to lead a restorative justice process. And I feel deeply, deeply proud of that work. I think that we're leading here in Vermont in restorative justice, and that's something that in Congress, uh, if I had the chance, would also like to help carry on for our state. Thanks. <clears throat> Beyond your concern over your personal result in this race, uh, what frightens you most about the November election? Dr. Myers? Well, you know, obviously there's concern that, uh, I, that the Republicans are going to take over the House again and possibly the Senate, and that uh, with the leadership that we see on the House side and the Republicans, that, that's a concern. Obviously, if it was someone more responsible than, than what we've seen, it would be a less concern. So. I'm concerned about that, and obviously, as we go forward into 2024, there the uh, concern deepens. Becca? I don't think you can watch the hearings, the January 6th hearings, and not feel like we are in danger of having any election that the GOP doesn't agree with the results, um, deciding that it was not a free and fair election. And, you know, when I see at what has come out in the last few weeks, there were really just a handful of people that saved us from having a coup, and that is terrifying. And so I, I am concerned that they have, with their incessant lies, they have colored um, our democracy as always being corrupt if their side doesn't win. Thank you, Molly. It's hard to put a finger on just one issue, but I think democracy, what is ahead for us, and are Americans or even some of us here in Vermont going to get so disenchanted with the hope and possibility and reality of what good government should and is, can be, that we start walking away from it. And I think that's why, and I say this every, every person I talk to, you have to vote, you have to get involved, this is your democracy, this is our government, if we want change, we have to participate in trying to get as many people to vote right now in the primary and obviously in the general, but I hope the same is true across this country and so that we can return to a place of government functioning again. Thanks. So we've, had, we've got other questions on a whole bunch of things from wealth disparity to uh, what in your personal experience is gonna help you uh, make decisions on important international affairs uh, issues and a lot on climate. Um, what are we gonna do to well, anyway, go to their websites. Uh, now they're going to have a one minute to clean up any messes 
uh, or correct any misimpressions or underscore any priorities. And uh, we really thank you for giving your all. This is really amazing. Your answers have been so uh, candid and thoughtful. Thanks. So let's start with. so very much for coming out tonight. It's good to see you. I feel hope in that we can come together here in the state, and I think we need more of Vermont and Washington right now. I'm here because I do think I'm the right person at the right time with the right experience for Vermont. Not only tonight have we talked about Ukraine, do I have a background in foreign policy, we've talked about human rights, we've talked about the judiciary, I have a strong legal background, I'm ready to uphold and protect the Constitution. I serve right now as their lieutenant governor. I understand what it's like to work um, with a legislature, with a governor, across party lines, work for every corner of the state. And while I say this with so much humility, I am proud to be a daughter of Vermont. I'm deeply proud to be from Orange County. I'm not sure we sent anyone from Orange County to Congress before. Um, but I will bring all of that experience to Congress right now. And I've spent a half decade working there, so we will get to work from day one doing all we can to deliver for the state but to get our democracy and our government back on track. Thank you again for having me. Becca? So thank you for coming out on this beautiful day where you could be absolutely anywhere. Um, really appreciate it. This is what, um, when Vermont is at its best, it's happening in rooms like this. So I just wanna say, I come to you as a teacher, as a mom, as an experienced legislator. I have spent eight years in the legislature passing legislation that directly impacts Vermonters in a positive way, from minimum wage increases to paid sick leave to the strongest reproductive rights uh, in the nation to housing investments and climate action. Anything that has passed the legislature in the last eight years has had my part in it, along with the wonderful Senator McDonald, who's here today, who is um, a champion for working people like no other in the State House. So I believe that I have the experience, I have the commitment, and I have the focus to do right by all of you. And I appreciate you coming out today. Thank you. Dr. Myers. Yes, I uh, come from, of course, the background of healthcare medicine, 20, over 25 years. And um, healthcare is 20% of our budget. It's gonna continue to increase each year. 100% of us will at some point interface with the healthcare system. I do know the strengths and weaknesses of the healthcare system. I want to make it more fair, I want to make it more simple. In some ways I want to go back to the future because I think it actually used to be better than it is now. Um, I've tried to maintain my compassion and care for my patients over the years, but over time you also develop a certain inner toughness, which I think is important when you're in Washington. There are going to be some tough votes. You cannot and should not make everybody happy. If you make everybody happy, it's probably probably done something wrong. So I think I've developed that inner toughness. And the one thing you learn beginning in medical school and right through residency in your practices, do the right thing. You hear it over and over and over, which means put the time and work in. Uh, help your colleagues when you need assistance. And most of all, do the right thing for your patient every single time you can. Thank you. One more round of applause, please. Billy, who was the most ardent, on time, terse, succinct? No pressure, Billy. Come on. Oh, yeah, right. I have one. Two more bottles. Thank you.